When I first decided that I'd go on the trip, one of the first things that came to my mind is that I'm going to be leaving my family. He's never really left Canada. I think he went to Disneyland. <laughs> Seattle. Seattle. Get in there, Jinx. You want to pop any guinea? <laughs> I have spent a great part of my life working with indigenous artists. Two of the world's great carving traditions are the Coast Salish people of the northwest coast of Canada and the Yatmil people of Papua New Guinea. I have always wanted to bring master carvers together from these cultures. So a Coast Salish artist, John Marston, decided to travel with me to Papua New Guinea to meet with master carver Teddy Belangu in Palembe village. My expectations were from meeting Teddy. I was thinking it's gonna be really neat to meet someone that's been doing this their whole life too in a completely different setting. This is the 11th time I've been to Papua New Guinea. I came first because I loved the art. I wanted to incorporate it within our business. And my sense from the very outset was that, that we had to do more than come and just buy pieces from unidentified artists. And if I could see, if I can see them that way, then it's so much easier to. long. Sak sak. Oh, oh he's, he's eating the sago. Yes. We've tried to educate the carvers over the years as to what their work is worth in the Western market. We do that by talking to them about the, the margin and the markup that we have to have to sell the work in a gallery. So how much? Because of the education that we've done, the artists that we've worked with for some time know the value of their work. Well, keep it. We think that's too low, and it should be 720. There's a lot of showing out at 20 kilometers, but that's all. But if we're working with a new artist, we ask them what they would like to be paid, and almost always it's worth at least twice and often five times what they think. Coming with Elaine on the river has been such an honor 
she's been able to kind of basically a crash course on their design work and their art. I'm just amazed like from the carvings that I've seen so far. I can't wait to get to Palembe and do some carving. constantly being amazed by the way people live around here. It's just uh, like an ancient way of living. It's really strange for me to see people actually going around in canoes and doing their daily things in their canoes. The only thing I can really compare it to is uh, old pictures that I've seen from the 1890s. This is worn sometimes uh, when the Mai Mas is worn yes. on, the top, on the top of the Mai Mas yes. in, the, in the costume. We are very fortunate that Carol Mayer is curator for Oceanic Art at the Museum of Anthropology in Vancouver because she has a very strong vision for contemporary art. It didn't occur to us right away that we were really both trying to do the same thing. And then we thought, well, maybe this so-called commercial gallery and a public institution could work together. And these are teeth? Yeah. When we started out uh, coming up the river, there was a lot of art that looked very similar to what we already had in the collection. And then gradually, as we started to look closer, certain pieces, certain artists, you could see a distinction between what was clearly being produced for, you know, uh, a, you know, a traveler's market or a tourist market, and then other pieces where you wanted to know who made it. Okay. Yep. Yep. Most tourists, they come up in a canoe and they stop and they buy and they leave and they've got, you know, these little and whatever. There is in a, a hook for the hanging baskets. But the, the basket. sad part of that is a lot of that work then gets offered to museums. And so then it ends up in museums and you end up with this cycle of not as great art as it could be, then becoming public. And then the public get an impression of the CPEC. Tourist art exists in every aspect of society. Unfortunately, with the work from Papua New Guinea, there hasn't been a distinction made between the tourist art and the fine art. Killer well. <clears throat> His mouth moves up and down. Mm -hmm. That's red cedar. Eagle. <laughs> With a wing pattern. Uh, salmon there.
I love to come to this village. It's full of very friendly people and it's very remote and uh, there are a lot of very good carvers here. Hello, Erin. How are you? Oh, yeah, very well. Really nice to see you. It's uh, pretty amazing to come to a place where so many people carve and they don't use power tools at all. Uh, I know how long it would take for me to carve something like that. As we came up the river, each time there was a distinct style that I was really unaware of. And the more I speak with Elaine, she enables me to see that individuality. So far, I've been on the river trying to um, find out about their legends and their stories and their traditions. They're so much the same as the ones at home. So much the same. The only difference is that the animals are different. So today we're going to Yamok, and my understanding is it's about an hour ride canoe, and then the rest we walk in. So far, since I've walked into their houses, I'm walking like back and forth. This is like river legs. Yeah, so it'll be really, uh, I think it'll be challenging. I think it might even feel a little dizzy walking on solid ground for a while. Solid ground. <laughs> I never realized when I met Elaine that she had been traveling the Sepik for so many years. And what was very, very clear as we traveled up the river, that she was people waiting for her. They knew she was coming, but they were extraordinarily pleased to see her. And they had things to tell, stories to tell, things to share. She is familial to them. Well, I'd like to look at these birds up here and find out who made those. Yeah, I, I really like this one very much. To see Elaine interact with all the carvers and, and actually really give them the prices that they deserve, you know, that means a lot to a carver. 
when mm -hmm. they're getting more than they're asking for, it shows that people really appreciate what they're doing, and I'm sure that helps them with their creativity. Uh, they probably don't feel so pressured just to put out tourist stuff, right? How's that? I'm so grateful to be here. I feel like it's it's such a gift. I think about what I can create from all this. When John was on the river, he was very quiet. And uh, I wondered what was happening. Because I have had people who traveled there with me who've become really quite culture shocked. <laughs> Hi. But he just seemed to be taking everything in stride, and, and he was. But he was absorbing, absorbing, absorbing all the way along. And to be there witnessing a culture that has never stopped carving. We're going to a village called Palembe that is known for all the master carvers that live there. I'll finally get to meet the man I've been looking forward to carving with. It's great to see you, Teddy, again. And this is Thank John you. Marston, Teddy Balangu. Welcome home. Nice to meet you, Teddy. Hello. Fine. Come a long Fine. way. <laughs> Fine. Long journey. Thank you. <laughs> When you're spending the time, you have to balance yourself. Yeah. Put your leg. Good. The paddle helps you balance too. The paddle helps yeah. you balance. So you live on, on this side of town? Or uh, town? <laughs> really? You live on this side of village? Yeah. <laughs> Happy noon. 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 Happy we have no dry land. <laughs> he is going to try to climb up and jump. Going way up yeah, to the top, way up eh? to the top and. <laughs> wet, wet, wet! Ah! <laughs> so this is the end of the village. Where you can see. Hey, you see that good sunset going down? Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah. We have a good day and good sunset going down. Perfect day. Yeah.
have some uh, special guys this morning. They came from Canada. It is a uh, part of our culture to show you most welcome to have you here in this place, Parme. Thank you very much for your visit to Papua New Guinea, East Peak and Parme. Thank you. It is with great pride that I bring John Marston. He's just been longing to get here and longing to, to sit down with you and actually carve. Thank you all. It was a breathtaking performance and we appreciate it very, very much. Soft enough? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's nice. When I was first arriving, I was trying to think of the kind of wood that I would like to work with. I thought I might have my choice, but it doesn't seem that way because, as you can see, there's so much flooding. So, uh, but when I got here, Teddy had a piece of wood ready for me to carve, and it was uh, garamote, and it's a uh, really hard wood. Wasn't too sure how, to, how it would work with my tools after watching him, so I just watched him for a little bit and uh, got used to how he was carving his piece. Today lives a really different life to me. He still lives off the land, whereas I basically go to the grocery store and pick up everything I need and go home and work. His life revolves around day-to-day -day living. Everything's such hard work. The carving's hard work, living's hard work, and I'd really admire it. I remember being told about the Sepik River's cultural and heritage and how everything was quite intact the way it had been for thousands of years. I was really happy to see that culture is, still exists like this in the world, but it made me scared to think that stuff like this can be lost. You listen to Teddy and all the other villagers talk, they know that they have to hold on to this. They know how important it is. And that's something that reflects to all the cultures. All the indigenous cultures know this. They have to hold on to it all, or else it'll be gone forever. When you're finished carving, Teddy, do you use sandpaper or do you just yeah, yeah, carve? Yeah, yeah. yeah. When we were in Palempe, we had all these carvers around us, and it was—it just felt like uh, carving mayhem. But it was—it uh, was quite the experience to have so many carvers around, a lot of energy. Everyone was so happy to do what they're doing, and it just—it uh, felt right. So this is the last day on the Sepik River and it's the water drum ceremony.
It's everyone's way of saying goodbye to us, and it feels like I'm taking in every last bit of inspiration before we head back. It seems overwhelming that the time has come for us to leave, but I know that the spirit of the land and the spirit of the people will stay with me forever. After having so much going on around us while we were on the river, it was hard to think about anything that I wanted to work on. It was more, it was more about just enjoying the experience. And for me personally, I express myself a lot better through my art, and I really want to capture how I felt when I was there in the pieces that I do. So for me, that takes personal time. And, time to think things over. Way more cut out, right? So it's only from there to there. That's it. And these tips. That touch. That show the circle. That's actually still a circle. Teddy's going to be arriving from Canada in a few weeks. He'll be working at the Museum of Anthropology on his 16-foot house post. Hopefully he'll be able to come over to the island and we'll be able to spend some time together. I'm so happy that um, Elaine and um, Carol just uh, chose me to go to Canada. So this can be a um, privilege for me to go. Hey, hey, hello. Hello. How was your trip? Oh, fine. Come on in. Thanks. This is uh, my mom. Mom, this is Teddy. Hi. Uh, How you doing? Hi. This is my brother, Luke. Luke. Hey, Teddy. Nice to meet you. Thanks. And this is Ashley. Hi. Nice Hi. to meet you. Thank you. And that's little Noah. Hi, <laughs> Noah. Hello, Noah. <laughs> I was worried about him, but now that I see you, I know he was in good hands. <laughs> he came up that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're all so, Sherry, are, are we all ready to go? Oh, great spirit, thank you for this wonderful day. Thank you for the opportunity to come together to share in love and healing and forgiveness. Great spirit, this much I pray. We are now going to journey, journey to the shores of our ancestors and join our families that is there waiting. No! 
wise, an artist, a keeper of his own culture, Kenny Fulangle, who joins us today to share in our culture. On behalf of John Marston and on behalf of Shemana's First Nation, we present this to Teddy as an honor for his presence. go with the shooting? Uh, good. Went good. well? Yeah. Have you had your hair cut? Oh, uh, yes. Wow! <laughs> <laughs> it looks, looks good. It's on Wednesday. <laughs> from the Sepik River. Oh, is that beautiful? This is my very first time to uh, make a totem pole. My culture is different, and whatever I'm going to make is different from this culture. And uh, I've seen that um, the totem poles, they're um, quite different. I can see lots of um, figures that are uh, human figures, bird and frogs, and um, more of the figures, they have tanks going down. Think bringing somebody from somewhere like the Pacific to a place like Vancouver, you think that you're gifting them with all sorts of wonderful opportunities, but in actuality, it's sort of turning that he's the one who's gifting. You know, he's the one that has a way of getting through all this artificiality that we surround ourselves with. It's very different from uh, New Guinea to Canada. The leaves are falling down, 
the snow is coming, the trees are naked, everything is uh, very different. So I like everything because uh, it's uh, very special and it's very uh, different from me. Teddy feels very strongly that he is here to carve something that represents Palembe. And they are very proud because it's the first clan post that will be raised outside of Papua New Guinea. Our ancestors, and even today, would tell stories through house posts or poles. So that's what uh, I wanted to do with this project was tell the story about the trip to New Guinea, what I went through personally, and trying to let that flow out through uh, my design work. See where it takes me. This is a man. Yeah. And where does and does he become a man when he comes out of the river? Yeah. He turns into this guy. Yeah. Okay, I get it. He turns into Port Mary. Into Port Mary. Yep. Okay. Having Teddy here at the museum actually has been an amazing experience. People come here expecting to see a Northwest Coast artist at work, and yet the person working is from Papua New Guinea, and it stops people in their tracks and they want to know why he's here. I'm happy that they can uh, they come and see me and talk to me because I, want, uh, I don't want to be lonely. Have you seen snow before? No, this is my first time. It's a very strange. I think uh, John, um, our relationship is, is my brother. Yeah, we are brothers right away, and you know, he was the first one to say it. You don't meet people like that all the time. It just hits you in the heart when you do. It reminds you there are still beautiful people in this world. Oh, well, should we look at your pool? You did too? Oh, yes, I did too. <laughs> because um, that wood didn't arrive. Oh, yeah, that, that's, that's the first one there. They <laughs> make the extra one. Yeah. Uh, they gave um, the traditional names, special names for each storm pole. This one is uh, Tuat Mary Pole. So that's like it has its own, its own spirit, kind of? Yeah. 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 Nice, to, nice and easy to carve? Yeah. Yes, very yeah. smooth. This totem pole I've given to the, to Canada. They can see that there's a sign of a uh, um, flag here. Yeah, right on. They can realize that uh, this is for uh, Canada. Made in Canada. <laughs> yeah. <laughs>
believe it was April that we went up the Sepik River to meet with Teddy. And I had this conversation with Teddy. Well, you know, he's coming here, influenced your work. He says, no. Uh, I have been instructed by the clan to do exactly this. But he does say when he goes back to his village, he's taken with him the drawings of the killer whale, right? And it's going to create some sculptures of the killer whale and the crocodile together. I'm great that uh, this um, Pacific art can be a uh, uh, supporting art for the uh, First Nation for this museum. So it can be attracted for many people to come into this museum. So, and it will be a um, great museum forever. Special for the um, for this event with the totem pole rising up. So this is the first time to display the totem poles out of the country. The museum is a familial sort of culture, and Teddy has somehow become part of that. And we're going to miss him terribly. Discovery, hasn't it, for you, John? And this incredible piece that you see here has been carved since John returned. Um, nine months it has taken him to carve, a gestation period, I guess you would call it. It's just been a long time that I've worked on it, and it's uh, actually kind of strange to be outside of the shop. And. Uh... <laughs> When I was in New Guinea, there was uh, one special moment that we had when um, Teddy Belengu asked us to name his grandson. I think that at that point, I had an idea of, you know, the kind of character that Teddy really was. And um, I was thinking the whole time, what could I possibly do to show my appreciation for the time spent in their land and with their people? The idea of going to New Guinea and being at home is reflected on the panel where the sun and the moon are reversed on either side, which is representative of two cultures, worlds apart, but also so much the same in so many ways. When I was creating it, my thought came to what was the one outstanding thing that I could represent on the panel, and it was the people. It was everyone that was within the culture. This is what the masks on the inside of the suns and the moons represent. I didn't want it to be obvious that you could see exactly what the faces were. The meaning behind that was, if you don't take the time to really try and understand people, 
take the time to learn about their culture, then you really wouldn't get to see a lot of things in this world. Together 